uh, notices or notes and presentations from Alex and then from Mark, um, just to provide a bit of a reality check on, on the aviation industry's favorite climate solution, uh, sustainable aviation fuels. So over to you, Alex. Thanks, Callum. And um, thanks to Shannon and Theo and Rosa. Um, my family's all in the UK and uh, I'm, I pro uh, promise not to fly as well. And uh, it's a dramatic and uh, uh, big, big pledge to make. Um, so yeah, I hope you really enjoy your time here in Australia. Um, so I'm just going to talk a little bit about the systemic issues and um, we'd all like to think that we could fly and it wouldn't have a massive impact on the, the climate. But we'd also like to think that industry or government have plans to to sort out the impact of aviation. Um, but in 2023 uh, here in Australia, we learned so much about what these two players have in mind in Australia, and it's not reassuring. And it's not reassuring because it's similar to uh, the UK. The government and aviation industry here teamed up in what they call a jet council which claims to have big plans towards net zero 2050. But uh, we've been uh, able to find no evidence that they can pull off such a thing. First thing to come out in Australia was a, a consulting company report telling us that there were three ways to decarbonize this 99% uh, fossil fuel industry. They said that the public attitude to flying could change and we become more eco-conscious or government could change and stop artificially stimulating the industry, or the industry could change fuels and make new fuels rather than refining oil. However, they said that we could expect a maximum 45% reduction in carbon from alternative fuels. Um, or if other scenarios played out, emissions from aviation could actually increase uh, during the next few decades. Uh, then we had Boeing team up with the CSIRO um, and, and find that 60% of fossil fuels could be replaced with fuels made of sugar waste, canola, pig fat, and other things. But that was the maximum uh, amount, and it's very tricky to do that. And there are many side effects of such a transition. Uh, it's two to four times the cost of fossil fuels to fuel planes that way, and uh, there's no one keen to pay those costs. They also found that only maximum 50-50 blends with jet diesel were possible in the current de decade. And, you know, by 2030, that is the critical decade for decarbonization. Um, so really, aviation could not lift its weight in this period, no matter what spin the industry puts on it. Uh, then uh, we look at what uh, no Australian policymakers look at, and that's uh, the non-carbon dioxide emissions. Um, scientists and the UK Jet Council made clear it's more likely that these effects are twice as important in warming than carbon, and this is only partially helped by switching fuels. Then we learned about the growth of the industry and how the UK Jet Council plans really don't add up because growth is making a mockery of any benefits from tech changes. The Chatham House analysis of the UK Jet Zero plans concluded technologies including efficiency, negative emissions, and alternative aviation fuels will not be sufficient to manage aviation emissions in the, if, if the industry keeps on growing. Finally, uh, last year, the Australian government green paper came out and is endorsed uh, this it endorsed this so-called sustainable fuel switch despite uh, no costing of the projects, no, no buyers willing to pay for them, and no way of making any significant inroads into the impact of aviation. Our fear at Flight Free Australia is that warming from aviation could actually increase over the coming decades from the settings airlines are leading government to make. So where is the zero in Jet Zero or Net Zero 2050? Now, there are ways to do this differently. For instance, we could stop the inequality of charging motorists 10 times as much tax for petrol for their car as airline passengers pay for fuel. Or we could cap or tax the jet fuel coming into the country so that if airlines really wish to decarbonize and grow at the same time, they have an incentive to do so. 
then again, we could uh, rule out subsidizing airlines when they fail, like we did during COVID from the taxpayer funds. Or we could build better railway links. Now, I'm sure you'd love that. Uh, and uh, New South Wales should really be doing this because it would make Melbourne to Sydney flying much less attractive if we had a, a quicker route between the two cities. But uh, one of the things that could actually reduce aviation warming are currently on the cards by our governments and they're not being talked about by industry. Um, meanwhile, Australians and the British, uh, of which I'm both, are amongst the highest sources of aviation warming. It's incredible that we average more impact from our aviation than people do in an entire year from many other countries from their whole lifestyle. Few people realize that flying UK to Australia and back is more warming than the total emissions of the average Spaniard or Italian from their lifestyle in a whole year. Or uh, maintaining top tier frequent flyer status requires 27 tons of warming per year. So this can continue when we're facing climate breakdown. Here are some images of what uh, this can look like. Coastal Risk Australia's image of an inundated Brisbane airport uh, top left uh, is uh, predicted by the current uh, predictions of sea level rise by 2100. Top right is planes on an inundated Cairns airport runway two months ago, 2023. Warning, warming equivalent to a new Luoyang power station bottom left uh, by approving a third runway for Tullamarine Airport here in Melbourne. Uh, would be a disaster. Uh, or the alternative we hope for is degrowth at emergency settings as required by climate science for unsustainable industries like aviation. So our decision makers may leave a terrible legacy. And for more on that, over to Mark. Thanks, Alex. Um, and thanks, Shannon, Theo, and Rosa for your inspiring story. I, I wish I was a little bit younger. I could uh, maybe emulate you. It's, it's so good to have examples, people, you know, in the predicament we're in, um, we need more examples of alternatives and alternative travel in this case. So thank you. I just wanted to um, quickly point out one additional problem with so-called sustainable aviation fuels. They're the ones made from carbon drawdown from the atmosphere. And I've got some slides. So I'll just... Um, screen share now. Um, the additional problems, the additional problem with the sustainable aviation fuels is they prevent global cooling. And I'll explain. We're always talking about the new emissions we keep adding to the atmosphere that make the planet hotter, that most of us know we need to urgently stop. But about the existing emissions, the CO2 already in the atmosphere, we talk about that less. At over 420 parts per million right now, they're clearly dangerously high given the climate impacts we're experiencing. And given they've already pushed warming to almost 1.5 degrees that the Paris Agreement said would be dangerous to exceed. In fact, when the CO2 was last at 420 parts per million, it eventually pushed warming to three degrees and the sea ended up 10 metres higher, which today would put the homes of I looked it up, roughly 600 million people underwater. So, so as well as stopping new emissions, we clearly need to remove existing emissions, get the 420 parts per million back under 350, draw down the CO2 and keep it in the ground, stop the warming and start the cooling. But standing in the way of this global cooling, actively preventing it on our issue, uh, sustainable aviation fuels. I'll call them SAF for, for short. Even if we were able to produce enough feedstock to fuel every flight with 100% SAF from tomorrow, the parts per million in the atmosphere wouldn't drop. That's because of the CO2 that's drawn down in growing the feedstock, the corn crop, the organic waste, the woody biomass, or the yet to be seen at scale, direct air captured carbon goes straight back into the atmosphere as emissions when burnt in flight. Offsetting also prevents cooling. 
even if offsets could be 100% effective, as in even if every time a plane put up a ton of emissions and there was a forest of growing trees that was able to draw, that drew down a, a ton of carbon, again, the parts per million in the atmosphere wouldn't drop. In fact, cooling is prevented whenever, like in cases like this, where, whenever drawn down carbon is used as an excuse for new emissions. So we need to be beware of most carbon neutral and net zero proposals. Our federal government is promoting both SAF and offsetting as ways to cut our aviation emissions, but they don't. They don't cut aviation emissions. And with both warming of three degrees and a 10 metre sea level rise will remain on the cards. So rather than growing biofuel crops and burning our organic waste, we should be keeping the carbon in the ground and draw down more prioritising regenerative agriculture and reforestation by putting the drawn down carbon back in the air, so-called sustainable aviation fuels can never make flying climate safe. Thank you. Over back to you now, Callum. Oh, thanks a lot for that, Mark and, and Alex. Um, yeah, some great insights into the reality of these fuels that are marketed as sustainable. As sustainable. Um,